In this video, we're going to take a look at the mole, a measurement of matter and molar mass. Why is taking measurements of matter important? The world in which we live in is quantized. Everything involves numbers, whether it's how far you need to travel or how much money you need to save for that new iPhone that's coming out or how long you have to wait for your favorite show that's going to be on TV. Well, in science, everything is quantized too. Experimental sciences involve taking a lot of measurements, doing a lot of calculations and using numbers to then get to a final result. So in taking measurements, there's three different ways in which you can take those measurements, whether it be by number or a count, by weight or by volume. In science and in life, there are a lot of different uh, quantities that have a word associated to them that are a fixed amount, whether it be like pair, which is always two, or a dozen, which is 12, unless it's a baker's dozen, which is 13, or score, which is 20. In science, we have fixed numbers also. So let's take a look at apples. And apples that can be bought three different ways. You can buy them per apple, per weight, or per volume. If you're going to just a convenience store down the street and you're just going to buy one apple, then they'll probably charge you 25 cents for one apple. But if you go to the grocery store and you're to buy them in bulk, they're going to charge you per weight, probably like 59 cents per pound. Or if you go to the orchard and you're picking them off a tree, you buy a bag, and as many apples as you can fit into that bag is what you're buying. You're paying for the volume of that bag. So let's take a look at apples and how we can relate two different measurements of those apples. We're going to relate mass with count. So I get this problem of 90 average size apples, and I know that one dozen apples has a mass of two kilograms. How can I associate mass and amount? So what we're going to do is analyze this problem. What kind of information is there in this problem? And find out what things do we know and what things do we not know. Also, what other background information maybe we know that will help us get there. So in going through this problem, just kind of as it reads, what is the mass of 90 average size apples? So what is a question word? So we know that's what we're trying to find. What is that mass? How many kilograms are we trying to find? Again, also that 90 average size apples. So I know that's what I'm going to start with. That's what I have to begin with. I also know that dozens relate to kilograms. And I say, oh, dozens. I know apples and dozens. One dozen apples is 12 apples because, again, that's a fixed quantity. And also from this problem, I know one dozen apples has a mass of two kilograms. So now I can take this information and through dimensional analysis, get from, again, one set of units to a different set of units. So I'm going to take my given and put it over one. Take that 90 apples, put it over one, make a fraction out of it, because I'm going to use conversion factors, which are fractions, to then, again, convert between different units without changing the overall value. So I need those equivalencies up top set together as a fraction to then make units I have reduce out getting to units that I want. So I have apples currently. I don't want apples. I'm trying to get to kilograms. So what's going to help me get towards kilograms? Looking at the information I have listed under my knowns, I know apples relates to dozens. So if I put apples on the denominator of my next conversion factor, I can take those apples and reduce out the apples, leaving me with dozens of apples, which is getting me closer to my kilograms. However, dozens of apples doesn't match kilograms, so I know I'm not done yet. So now taking a look up at our, our knowns, and what else do I know about dozens of apples? Well, I know that for every one dozen apples, there are two kilograms of apples. So again, having dozens now in the denominator, anything divided by itself is one. It reduces out and leaves me with kilograms of apples. Now those kilograms of apples matches the units I'm trying to find of my unknown. So I know I've reached the end, and I can just solve out and find that there are 15 kilograms in 90 average size apples. But lastly, you want to make sure you evaluate, make sure does that answer make sense. So kind of just quickly going through the math, thinking, all right, well, dozens roughly 10, and 90 divided by 10 is 9. And if there's 9 times 2 kilograms for every set of 10, that's roughly 18. So 15 is pretty close to 18, so I know I'm kind of in the ballpark, so I'm probably in good shape. If I was somewhere drastically off of that 18, if I was like 100, or if I was only like 2, then I know that I probably made a mistake, and I should look back over my work. But being in that ballpark, give me a rough idea that my answer is possibly correct so I can continue forward with that answer. And again, the units also match up with also a good indication of I probably did this problem correctly. However, in science, we're not usually talking about things in dozens. We're going to talk about a much larger scale, much more quantity. So that way, there's something that is much more workable for us. So we're going to talk in terms of the mole. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of anything is one mole. 
Again, it could be dollars, it could be grains of sand on the beach, but we're going to usually talk about in terms of representative particles. So this number is called Avogadro's number, named after Lorenzo Romano Amadeo Carlo Avogadro. It's kind of a mouthful, we'll just keep it at Avogadro's number. He's an Italian scientist that was studying gases and how at a fixed volume, pressure, and temperature, it actually had the same amount of particles no matter what the gas was. This wasn't actually later discovered to be that number until um, a man called Johann Joseph Loschmidt discovered it, but it was named after Avogadro because he's the first one to realize this relationship. And again, it's going to be for mostly just used for really small particles, again, these representative particles, depending on what the substances we're looking at. So if it's an element, we know it's made up of only one type of atom, so we're talking about atoms. But if it's an ionic compound, then we talk about formula units. And if it's a molecule, then obviously we're talking about molecules. It's non-metals bonded together. It could also be ions if we're looking at ionic compounds and then as they dissociate when they put it into solutions. But we're not going to talk about terms of ions too much. And since this is an equivalent measurements, we can use them to convert between different sets of units. So one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of anything, so I can use that now as a conversion factor. I can use it in both directions. If I want to get to moles and I have representative particles, I can use it in a way that the representative particles reduce out, leaving me with moles, so I can solve for moles, or I can use the inverse in a way that makes moles reduce out, leaving me with representative particles. So here's an example we're trying to get from atoms to moles. So looking at magnesium, which is a metal that's often used in alloys because of how light it is and how when it oxidizes, it doesn't just flake away like iron does. And so it's often used as an alloy with other metals uh, to gain those properties. So looking at 1.25 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of magnesium, trying to figure out how many moles that is, we got to go through a conversion because we're going from one set of units to a different set of units. So we're going to list out our knowns and our unknowns as we kind of get them out of our problem. So again, as it starts off, how many moles? Well, that's what I'm trying to find. So that's my unknown. That's what I'm trying to get to. And I know that I'm given that 1.25 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So that's what I have. That's what I'm going to start with. And I know the relationship between moles of anything and that is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them are one mole. And since magnesium is an element, we are talking about the representative particle of atoms. So now I can take my 1.25 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of magnesium, put over 1, my given over 1, and use that conversion factor in a way that allows me to reduce out atoms. So if I put the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of magnesium in the denominator, anything divided by itself is 1. So again, it reduces out, getting me to moles of magnesium. And then solving out, I find that there are 0.21 moles of magnesium in 1.25 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of magnesium. I also can use this relationship the other direction, getting from moles to atoms. So we're going to take a look at propane, C3H8. It's used in gas grills and therefore um, it's good for combustion, releasing heat, exothermic. So we're going to take a look at 2.12 moles of propane. How many atoms are there involved in that 2.12 moles of propane? So again, analyze the problem out what is known, what is unknown. So how many atoms, that's what we're going to try and find. That's our unknown, those number of atoms. And then I'm given 2.12 moles of propane. That's what I have. So again, relating atoms and moles, I say, oh, representative particles and moles. I know the relationship between a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of that. However, propane C3H8 is a molecule. So there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of propane in one mole of propane. So I don't have atoms yet. I need to look at uh, the makeup of propane, C3H8. I know that's made up of three carbon atoms and eight hydrogen atoms. So it's made up of 11 atoms in total. So now I'm going to put these conversion factors together, starting again with my given over one. And how do they fit together to make units I have reduce out, get me to units that I want. So my 2.12 moles of propane over one, I know I need moles of propane on the bottom and I up in my knowns I see I have one mole of propane is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of propane so putting the moles on the bottom they reduce out now I'm up to molecules of propane as a unit that I'm left with 
However, that doesn't match my unknown, so I know I need to keep moving forward. Well, what other relationship do I have? I know that one molecule of propane is 11 atoms of propane. So putting molecules on the bottom allows that to reduce out, leaving me with atoms. So now I know that since my unit that I have remaining matches my unknown, that I'm at the end, and I can do out the math and find that there's 1.40 times 10 to the 25th atoms within 2.12 moles of propane. So that's how count relates to moles. We're going to take a look now at how mass relates to moles. For any given element, the number of grams that there are in a mole is equal to its atomic mass. So taking a look at hydrogen with an atomic mass of 1, for every 1 gram of hydrogen, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of hydrogen. So again, that's called the molar mass, the mass of 1 mole. And that works for every single element on the periodic table. Its atomic mass is its molar mass. So comparing 12 grams of carbon to 16 grams of oxygen, since those are the molar masses of those two elements, then I have 1 mole or 6.02 times 10 to 23rd atoms of each of those if I have that amount of their molar mass. So 12 grams of carbon and 16 grams of oxygen would involve the same amount of particles. I can then find the mass of an entire compound looking at its makeup, taking up the number of atoms of each element that are in that compound, multiplied by their atomic mass, and then finding the sum of all those pieces. So take a look here at sulfur trioxide that's made up of one sulfur atom and three oxygen atoms. Well, I know sulfur has an atomic mass of 32.1, oxygen has an atomic mass of 16, there's three atoms of oxygen, so 16 times 3, 48, plus the 32.1 grams that come from sulfur. I know the molar mass of sulfur trioxide is 80.1 grams per mole. And then taking a look at one more molar mass, looking at the molar mass of hydrogen peroxide. So the per tells us it's an extra oxygen. And we know that hydrogen and oxygen like to form water in that two to one ratio. So per an extra oxygen, two hydrogens to two oxygens. It's a really good antiseptic. It's also very good as used releasing energy to launch rockets. So looking at its makeup, knowing that hydrogen has an atomic mass of one, oxygen has an atomic mass of 16, I can then take the number of atoms of each and their masses and find the mass of the entire compound. So take the number of atoms of each element within that compound times the atomic mass of each of those elements and then adding them together. So two atoms of hydrogen times its atomic mass of one, two atoms of oxygen times its atomic mass of 16, then adding those two together, we find that hydrogen peroxide has a molar mass of 34 grams per mole.